Good morning, Little Country Church. Glad to be here. Glad to be able to be speaking to you through the internet. I hope you guys are doing well wherever you may be. We're going to pray. We're going to get this service started. I pray that you're able to receive wherever you're at, that whatever you're doing, the Lord's able to speak to you, that you have open ears, open minds, and and most of all, just hope. I pray that the Lord is giving you hope in whatever you're doing. I'm excited and knowing that there is a bright future. That this will end, and one day we'll be able to hug next again. Lord, I love you, and I thank you. I'm grateful for the fact that you came down, you loved us, you greeted us, and Lord, you said that when your son came, that he bring life and life more abundant. I pray for abundant life. Whether I'm stuck in a house or whether I'm at work, Lord, there is abundant life waiting for me. I just got to go find it. And so, Lord, I just pray that people's minds are being filled with you and not just silliness through our days, but we are able to continue just to run after the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we wouldn't hold back. We wouldn't take a step back, but we're moving forward. We are ambassadors. We are the king's sons and daughters, and we say yes to you. Whatever you would have us to do, Lord, let us to do it. Let our minds be sharp. Let our minds to continue to dwell on you, not the things of this earth, not the fact that the coronavirus is spreading, but the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for us that his blood was shed for us, that we don't have to wait back, we don't have to stop, but instead we get to move ahead. I'm thankful for our pastor and what you're doing in his life. I pray that you keep everybody safe that is under the umbrella of TLCC. And Lord, I just pray that you would just put a smile on everybody's face today, that they would know that they are your son and daughter, and that, Lord, there is a place for them in heaven, that there is something waiting for us on the other side of this, and that, Lord, we will continue to do good to others, that we lift up your name, and we continue to exemplify you in our Facebook posts, in our thoughts, and in our actions. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor David. Appreciate that. Hey, good morning, little country church. Good morning, Texas. Good morning, America. Good morning around the world. We're glad that you tuned in to holywild.tv, whether it be on our uh, app or on our uh, Facebook, wherever it's at. You have your Bibles open to Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It's the same place we started last week, so it's important that we reconnect back on this moment. Now, I want to tell you, over the last few weeks, I've talked to more pastors than I've had in years probably your pastor I've talked to. Uh, they've been calling. I've called some of them. We're staying in touch. And we believe it's a resetting right now of the church world. And there's actually a pivot moment. There's, I don't know exactly where we're going to go, how things are going to happen, but it's an amazing thing that is taking place right now that you're having to listen to the voices that speak into your life on the internet. And uh, eventually, of course, we'll be able to drive in out at the uh, other campus. And we are always excited about seeing people. If you can come out there but I love this season. I love what's happening during the Easter season. It draws us. There's almost a spiritual revolt among people to say, we are going to worship God. We're going to remind ourselves of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, there's this, uh, this, this push, this excitement toward next week. And so this being Palm Sunday or the day they would consider that Jesus, actually, it's a Sunday, but Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And then, of course, he went through Gethsemane. He went into, up to Gabbatha. And then he ended up in, uh, of course, there at uh, Golgotha. We're going to talk about that today. But Joel chapter 2, verse 12. But there's also this. It's not too late. God's personal message, come back to me and really mean it. Come fasting and weeping, sorry for your sins. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. Listen, one of the things that I'm a little bit bothered about right now is we have more fear of a virus than we have a fear of God. If you have a fear of God, 
It, it, it pushes you into a state where you, well, maybe you won't completely quit sinning, but you're going to quit doing a lot of things you used to do. You begin to change your life, not just your clothes. Things begin to shift inside of you. You begin to pray. Look at the Word of God. The, the fruits of the Spirit start coming into your life. Love, joy, peace, love. When's the last time you really took a good look at yourself? And this right now is making us do that. I have a fear of Him that could put me in hell fire more than I have of this virus that can put me into a hospital or quarantine me in a room guys we got to wake up we got to think about this a little bit more i fear god amen but it doesn't make me scared it makes me excited man this this kind of godly fear forces us into a more of a closer walk with him god is kind he's merciful he takes a deep breath i've often asked the question will there be air in heaven I don't know, but this scripture tells me that God takes a deep breath. So if there's air in heaven, we would breathe out this air and breathe in that air. It would be that quick of a transition when God takes us from this earth and these earth suits are over with. I want you to see again, come back to God, your God, and here's why. He's kind, he's merciful, he takes a deep breath. He puts up with a lot. This most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel catastrophe. Those two words have been my prayer. God, if it takes a week, if it takes a month, if it takes six months, if it takes a year, cancel catastrophe. And that we feel that we're heading toward that because we've never been in this place before. In my lifetime, in your lifetime, we've not been here. So we got to ask God to cancel catastrophe. Do you have another place you can call on? Can you call on the local government? Can you call on our mayor? Can you call on our governor? Can you call on the White House? Can you call on the Democrats or the Republicans? They can't cancel this thing. They can only prolong it. We need God to step in and cancel this catastrophe. Last week, I started with what, uh, a premise about a premiere of preview. We talked about Jesus, his hour coming. And as we moved toward it, we, we dealt with several people, Malchus, Peter, Barabbas, the thief on the cross. So first, remember that God gives previews. Like a drive-in theater. Amen. When you go in, you want to see the previews of something. We realized that Abraham was going to have a son in his old age, but we didn't know how the premiere. Is that on the overhead? I thought it was. Amen. So there's that premiere that's going to take place. Second, there's a place. The guest chamber for the Last Supper, the traitor designated. We talked about Gethsemane. Usually a place of, of prayer, under pressure. There was Gabbatha, the trial and second chances. Now there was Golgotha, the place of the skull, the crucifixion. And then the people. Every scene, there's people. In this scene today, we're going to see the weeping women. We're going to hear Simon. Hear about Simon of Cyrene, the, the mob. You're going to pick up on a mob here and the soldiers and, of course, the thieves on the cross. There were two things that happened on the way to Calvary. First was known as the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrow. The scripture says in Luke 23, verse 26. Now, I want you to imagine with me that Jesus has been whipped. He's been beat. Blood has, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine how much blood has left his body. And here on his way there, the scripture says he was carrying his cross along with the two thieves. I can't prove this, but it looks to me like they took the cross from him and gave it to Simon to have Simon to carry it. In my heart of hearts, I believe Jesus could have carried that cross all the way to Golgotha. He came to embrace that cross. He talked to us about carrying our own cross. And as they led him away, they see Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now, again, it's been a long night. A lack of sleep, trials, mockery, loss of blood. There in the garden, the scourgings, the beatings, his beard plucked. Simon now is carrying the cross of Christ. And then as they're moving through, and if you can see it with your mind's eye, as they're moving through the city of Jerusalem, leaving Gabbatha, heading up to Golgotha, they're moving through a place, and the women are there, and they begin to wail. All through Scripture, we see wailing women. We find them in Jairus' daughter's house. Amen. She's, they're wailing there. They were wailing at the widow of Nain. They're wait, wailing there. They're, they're crying out. They're, they're asking for a change. Well, here we see that women are doing it again. Verse 27 says, A large number of people followed him, including women, who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters, and again, let me just mention that. Oftentimes, we don't pick up on how much he was a father figure. He would call uh, men who were going through life son. He called the woman with the issue of blood daughter. Here, he calls these folk here daughters, daughters of Jerusalem. Do not weep for me. 
Weep for yourselves and for your children. And the scripture would go on to tell us that he tells them that it would be better for the mountains to fall on you, for stones to fall on you. You're going to ask for them to fall on you. For if men would do these when the tree is green, what will happen in its day? Now, let me give you some history here. First, they begin to weep for him. And in weeping for him, he looked back and reversed it. Though struggling, you know, this is the saying before the cross. Though struggling though he was, he looked at them and told them, don't weep for me, but weep for yourself. When I study history, I realize the Jews became more and more rebellious and revolted against Caesar, against the Roman authority. In 67 AD, Nero appoints Vespasian in charge of Judea, who brings several legions and begins a slow and methodical campaign of destruction to the Jews from the city that lasts two years. Then his son Titus in 70 AD, the believers, they knew what was going to happen. They began to run to the mountains. But that left millions inside the city. Believers there inside the city, the atrocities there, the, what I understand was over 1.1 million people that had died in the siege. Luke 21, verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that it is a desolation is near. Now, I know there are people that believe that's going to happen in the future. I believe that it's already happened that it's neither here nor there right now. But historically, we know that it did happen. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be a great distress in the land and wrath against this people. 1.1 million people died of starvation inside Jerusalem as Titus surrounded it in 70 A.D. I think of this virus and the, the people that, that we've lost through that and the people that we've lost through the flu, with people we've lost through drunk driving, the people that we've lost through abortion, with people, you know, guys, it just goes and on. There is life and there is death. It's a, there's an entrance and there is an exit. And not trying to be little and put down, we often sound unsympathetic toward those that are struggling with this virus, but I'm telling you, that death has always been 1.1 million. The, the history tells us the women actually turned and began cannibalism toward their children. It's, a, it's an atrocity. It's, it's a sadness. That's why Jesus said, hey, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. This is why I'm telling you. you. You can be scared of this little virus, but I have a bigger fear of God than I ever will of a little virus that's moving around the world. And so I keep reading about this place, Golgotha. Did you know when you look at Golgotha from a, from a distance, it has that look of a skull? That's why they called it the place of the skull. And if you'll allow me, it's 9 a.m., and up the road comes a group of people. The soldiers know that two of the men being crucified, well, they're just average Joes, average criminals, if you would. They're low life, according to those that are around. But the third man, this preacher from Nazareth, well, he's a different case. They really don't know who he is. They know it's important because they sense the buzz in the crowd. There are more people than usual. By the way, that was one of the fringe benefits, if you want to call it that, for being on the crucifixion squad. You never worked alone. There's somebody morbidly fascinating about watching somebody die. You, you go to watch the races. You remember back in the day when they used to have NASCAR? Yeah, it was, what, months ago? Right. Well, a lot of times when I went to Talladega as a kid, I went to see Richard Petty race, and I also wanted to see a wreck. And that's the way these were about the crucifixion. The people of Jerusalem, at least some of them, they loved to come out to see this. Well, maybe they didn't love it, but they couldn't stay away. Some strange magnetic force drew them back to Skull Hill again and again. But this day, there were more people than usual. A bigger, bigger crowd, they're noisier, rowdier, milling to and fro, waiting for the action to begin. And up the road, here comes a parade of people. Three crosses being brought in. There's a foreigner carrying a, a third cross and a man beaten beside him. The crowd swirls around him and begins to, to, to look at the figure. A man not quite six feet tall. Now walking each step in agony to behold, half man, half a creature from the worst nightmare you've ever seen. He'd been beaten with an inch of his life. His back was in shreds. His front was covered with the markings of a whip. His face was disfigured, swollen there, had ripped out his beard from the roots, and on the head, a crown of thorns, six inches, stuck down under his skin. A shell of a man, if you would. A man already looking more dead than alive. Then the fellows on the crucifixion detail saw that. They weren't unhappy because sometimes people got a little feisty when you tried to nail them to the cross. They took the cross, they laid it in the ground, put his body on it, they nailed the hands they nailed his feet. They dropped him in, one hand over the other, a spike in both wrists. 
there with ropes in place. They began to pull the cross up. Now Jesus, blood spurting from the raw wounds he had. Steady now, boys. Don't drop it. It was a terrible thing to drop a cross before they got it in the hole. They dropped it in and it fell with a thud. And there was Jesus. And this is a part we often miss. He was naked. We, every picture we've ever seen has Jesus with a cloth around him. But the scripture says they rolled dice for his, his garments. Naked and not ashamed. There on the cross, his body, literally the nakedness covered up now with blood. Then there were three. Luke chapter 23, verse 32 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. The crucifixion, the hands used to heal, that broke the bread, blessed the children, the place of concentrated nerves. They drove a spike through the muscle and the nerves. The feet used to carry the good news. They drove the spike through his feet. No Novocaine at Calvary, his back, his stomach, his face torn, thorns piercing his head, hands and feet pinned to the wood, picked up and dropped in, put a title over his head. There was written above him which said, this is the king of the Jews. The chief priests, they requested the religious leaders who had him crucified and used the Romans to do it. The wording, they asked, change the words. John chapter 19, verse 19. Pilate had noticed, a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. I think of this today when people say, don't tell me who Jesus is. He's a curse word or he's a by word. My friend, he's not just king of the Jews. He's king of the world. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. What Pilate said was of a truth. That's exactly who, his words, who he was. And then when he gets on the cross, this is the amazing thing to me. This is, again, when you think of the premiere, we've seen the preview as hours coming. We've seen him in the guest chamber washing the feet of the disciples. We've seen the traitor go out Judas. We see the traitor come back in Gethsemane. We see Peter, James, and John. Again, when the pressure is great, your circle gets smaller. We see this thing going on, and we didn't realize this was all going to be in the movie. I didn't know this was how this was going to play, be played out. And it, we thought he would just come and die, and that would be it. But no, all of these characters begin to get added. There's Simon now at the bottom of the cross thinking, I carry this man's cross, and he's guilty of what? There's Malchus pulling on his right ear. He did what? There's Barabbas standing out there saying, he took my place at the cross? Why, how, how could this man be unjust? How could this man be a criminal? They see it all. The movie is playing out. Now that he's on the cross, he has a thief to his right and one to his left. And what will he say? A title over his head, the king of the Jews. And his first words as he was on the cross was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How many times have we looked at life and realized, you know, we really don't know what we're doing. I pray during this time of isolation, insulation, quarantine, wherever you're at, that you have an opportunity together with God and say, God, listen, that, that's some things I've done. I, forgive me. Forgive me. And as Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lot. The people stood watching. And the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, the soldiers also came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There's something about a, a mob rule. When mobs get together and they, they just begin to incite one another. And now the soldiers are getting involved with it. If you be the king of the Jews, if you be him, get yourself down from here. As they drove the spikes, he said, Father. As they pierced his hands, he said, Father. As they dropped him in the hole, Father. As they uncovered his nakedness, Father. As he sneered and mocked him, Father, he prayed for his murderers. He took our sin. The Message Bible says in Isaiah 53, 12, catch this. Therefore, I will reward him extravagantly. The best of everything. The highest honors. Because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest. 
He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. Isaiah 53, 12. I want you to look at this again with me. If you have your Bibles here. The best of everything is what I'm going to give you. Because he looked death in the face. He looked death right in the face. And he said, you know what? I'm telling you right now. This is my son. I love him like that. Each utterance spoken with the utmost difficulty and pain. The only way to speak was to push oneself up on the spike. His last words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, I can preach a whole message on that. I can tell you forgiveness has been the greatest gift that's ever been given to me. To think to myself that I was once damned, that I was once judged, that my life was one of no direction. The day that I gave my life to Christ, understanding the revelation of the blood of Jesus and forgiveness. I know many of you are starting to pick up on that because the blood on the doorpost the death angel passing over. Man, you're so scared of this virus, but I'm going to say it again. Blessed is he that has more fear of God in him than fear of this virus. Amen. That you have a fear of him and you want to do the right thing by him. Then his next words were amazing. These two men who were crucified on the outer crosses differed on one main point. How they viewed the man in the middle. They saw him differently and therefore asked of different things. One man wanted escape, not forgiveness. The other man wanted forgiveness and not escape. Verse 39 tells us one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Now watch this. The first guy said, if you, if you Jesus, you know what he's doing? He's echoing what he heard the mob and the, uh, the soldiers say. Because they said the same thing. If you be who you say you are, get yourself down from there. And now he's just echoing it. He's, you know, some folks are just so dumb. They'll just keep repeating other dumb statements over and over again. And that was this guy here. The other fellow, the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? There it is. Fear. We didn't see it in the movie, but now it's starting to come together. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today, wherever you're at, just say today with me. I've often said this over and over, that there are two days in the Bible, this day and that day. And that's how we love God this day that's going to determine what's going to happen to us on that day. And on this day, this thief, whatever day that was 2,000 years ago, said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, this is made more amazing when you consider that this man had none of the advantages the disciples had. He never heard Jesus teaching by the seashore. He never saw Jesus heal the sick or raise the dead. He knew nothing of Jesus. Great parables. He never saw any of his miracles. This man missed all the outward signs of Jesus' kingship, yet he believed. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that if you have an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, do it today. Today. Some people have that, I'm going to be like the thief on the cross and wait to the last day or the last month. You, you have no guarantee of that. I do have a hope for this man and for many like him. I'm going to tell you some more stories in a minute. But as I look at this passage, I first tell you, learn his parables. Read about his healing. Get to know him and draw close to him. As Paul said, I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. I just want to know him. But if many like this guy here on the cross, he didn't get to see any of that. And yet he said, today, I, I, would you, today I, I'd like to be with you in paradise. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I think he saw the sign. He saw how he handled death. We said this often. We live well. We've got to learn how to die well. And he looked at him and he saw how he died. And he understood. And listen to me again. Not trying to be morbid or insensitive. But Jesus knew the, the beating he took was just this earth suit. That God was going to reward him extravagantly. He was going to set him high for staring death in the face and taking care of it. The scripture says afterward, you know, he went to death, hell, and grave. We'll talk about that next week. He had the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But how do we know this thief was saved? How do we know? We know he was saved by the answer Jesus gave in verse 43. I tell you the truth. Truth was speaking. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Truth was talking. I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. This gives a light to three things I want to mention in closing. First, immediate salvation. The Greek word today is the first word in the phrase. Jesus put it there for an emphasis. Today, 
you'll be with me in paradise. Meaning, this very day, the day of your crucifixion, whatever or whatever paradise is, Jesus told the thief that he was going to be there that very day. Immediate. There are some that believe that somehow salvation is drawn out. I do believe in justification by faith. That it's by grace we're saved. Today we're saved. I do know that our soul is cleaned up. It's called sanctification. It's a process. Your mind didn't get right immediately. It takes some time. And then there'll be this glorification. God's going to give us another body. And the scripture says we'll know each other as we're known. Wouldn't it be very important for you to get to know more people? So when you get to heaven, you'll know more people when you get there also. That we'll know each other. Oh, that's going to be an amazing time. Second, personal salvation. Again, the Greek words are very important. The phrase is, is met emul, which really means to be with me in a very personal way. It is not you over there and me over here. It's you and me together, side by side. It means to be in the personal presence of another person. Wherever Jesus was going, the thief would be right beside him. And third, kingdom salvation. Salvation here, the word paradise is a crucial word. The scholars tell us that it originally referred to the walls of a garden of the Persian kings. When a king wanted to honor his subjects, he would invite them to walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. This same word was used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to the Garden of Eden, where God walked with Adam and Eve. He's going to walk with us. It's a revelation and an understanding. Revelation chapter 2, 7 refers to it as heaven. It is a place of beauty, openness, and an inexpressible blessedness. You can't describe how wonderful it's going to be. If you take these promises together, what well, we just mentioned, immediate salvation, personal salvation, kingdom salvation, and you look at them, it's a remarkable thing that Jesus is saying to this thief who has lived his entire life in crime. Upon his death, he transferred to heaven and where he will be in the personal presence of Christ. The thief received much more than he asked for. What a day this was for the miss. miss be I didn't see it coming. Man, when I was watching the movie, when I knew the preview, it said that, that Jesus was going to die on the cross, but I didn't see this guy getting saved. I didn't see how this was going to be possible. I'm going to tell you that today is important for you. I know that baptism is important. It shows the whole world that you're saved. I know works is important. It shows the whole world you're appreciative. But they're not going to save you like the grace of Jesus. So let me talk to you real quick today. Could you make this day your day? You often hear me talk about November the 10th, 1979. That was my day. A place called Cherry Hill, Alabama, Faith Tabernacle, where I got born again. The song that you hear that comes on every service at the little country church was done by one of the worship leaders who eventually started going there to that church, Lenny LeBlanc. It's, 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 I, this has been my life, so I go back to it. And I tell you that today is an important day for you. So you just call out to him with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Let the blood wash over my home. Protect me from evil, disease, wickedness. Let me live under the shadow of the Almighty. It's where I want to abide. I want to learn of you and know of you. And if, it's, if, this, if this happens to be my last day on earth, then I say, Lord, I want to see you in paradise. I want to be your child. So let your grace do the work in my life. I give you thanks for this day. We bless you for the premiere. Oh, it's not over. There's more to the story. Yes, yes, yes. Our king dies, but he resurrects. I'll see you again on Easter Sunday. I pray your week is blessed. I pray God favors you in all that you do. I give God thanks for you. I miss the people of the little country church. I miss friends that are connected with other houses of God. Oh, how I long to put my arms around you. There'll be a residue if you're not careful of fear that'll stay on you when this thing lifts. I'm, I'm going to rebuke that residue in Jesus' name and ask God to set us free. Let us walk in freedom and in the fear of God. In Jesus' name, till I see you again, God bless you. David, would you give a couple of closing announcements? Stay with me. And again, I just want to mention this to you. If you would like to come out and join us today at 1030 in the next hour, we'll be meeting out at New Caney, Texas. 
Uh, you see the address there on the, on the announcement, our drive-in church. I, th I heard the first 50 folk going to get popcorn. Look out now. This is going to be a great day, the Little Country Church drive-in service. All right, pastor didn't turn me up. I'm good. All right. <laughs> uh, today you watch it live, 9 a.m. Go ahead and tune us in. If you guys have seen that, you're watching me now. Uh, I'm waiting for the overheads to come over here. We're going we're gonna to knock this out. Crosby Campus Service, it's going to be closed to the public, but you can watch us every week at 9 a.m. Tune in, watch, see what Pastor has to say. He always has something great to say. You can come to the drive-in church. That'll be in New Caney. Um, Pastor already said 1030. No Easter egg hunt next week. Plan your own family activities. Justin Gambino will be there on Easter. Come to the Sunday in New Caney for the drive-in service. It's going to be an incredible time of just acoustic worship. And, and really, just time... To be able to set aside to be able to worship our king. Uh, we are still having the Zion's Lions motorcycle ride April 11th. Pack a picnic lunch for Brenham area blue bonnet ride. And I think you guys might actually see some blue bonnets. I happened to be uh, driving the other day and seen some popping up. You might actually get to see some blue bonnets this year. I know I say every year it's a blue bonnets, but... You might actually get to see some this year. Ways to give uh, your tithe. You can call the TLCC office and you can give that way. You can mail or drop it off in New Caney Campus uh, office location. You can give online at holywildministries.com or you can give through the Holy Wild app. It's important to give. Listen, you giving isn't for the church. It's for you. It will bless you. And I pray that you continue to give. Today, as you give, we are believing that you're going to receive jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and as always, success to the kingdom. We pray for success to you and your family. We love you. We bless you. Jesus, Lord, I just thank you for everything you're doing in their lives. I pray that as they give today, Lord, they would be blessed. And that if they're hearing us today, that they're blessed by your word. They're washed by your word. And for those that gave their lives for the first time to you, I just pray that, Lord, as heaven celebrates, as heaven is applauding, as heaven is excited that they are now, their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Lord, I just pray that they feel uh, joy like they've never felt, joy unspeakable. I thank you for all those that have rededicated their lives, that, Lord, it wouldn't be just another time, but this would be the time that sticks. This would be the time that their lives would be forever changed, that their destinies would be forever changed, that their families would be forever changed, simply because they recognize and realize that there was a void, and his name was Jesus, and they accept the fact that you are Lord, and they make you that. I'm so thankful for what you're doing in the little country church and for what you're doing in the body of Christ around the world. May the words of pastor reverberate through the kingdom that, Lord, the fear of God is more important than the fear of disease, that the fear of death and the fear of pestilence and the fear of anything, because we know that your name is above every name. We give you praise. We give you honor. I just pray blessings over every person that hears us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Y'all have a blessed week. Thank you.